Pull to order, and I will ask Amy to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, under our special presentations and proclamations section of the agenda, Memorial Day is this Monday, May 29th. John? Yes, uh, next mon Monday, the city of Dublin and our nation will pause to honor those who made the ultimate sacrifice while serving our country. I would like to invite everyone to join us for this important patri patriotic event on Memorial Day, Monday, May 29th. We will gather at noon at the Grounds of Remembrance in Dublin Veterans Park well, we will hear from Dr. Chris Ann Gordon, who is the Medical Director of Rehabilitation Services at Memorial Hospital of Union County and the founder of the Resurrecting Lives Foundation, which coordinates and advocates for the successful transition to a post-military career and life for veterans with traumatic brain injury. Following the ceremony, on behalf of the Dublin City Council and the City of Dublin, we would like to invite everyone to join us for a complimentary picnic on the grounds of the Dublin Library. We invite the community to join us as we pay tribute to our nation's heroes. I would also like to acknowledge Jeff Noble, the commander of Wesley G. Davis American Legion Post 800. Each year, Jeff helps coordinate our salute to Veterans Day and our Memorial Day services. Unfortunately, Jeff cannot be with us tonight, and Allison Leroy we would like you to uh, come forward and share the plans for the Memorial Day procession, which will proceed at the ceremony at the Grounds of Remembrance. So, Allison. Good evening, members of council. Um, yes, I am representing um, both the American Legion and the VFW local post um, and Jeff Stead. He would do probably a much better job of representing than I will. Um, but we do, they do host a special ceremony before the city ceremony. There's a parade that starts first over at the shops at River Ridge. And we cross the bridge. And they throw the commemorative wreath off the bridge. And then they end up at the cemetery where they do a special commemoration there as well. Following that, the bagpiper will leave, lead everyone over to the grounds of remembrance to continue the city ceremony. And we are looking right now, we're looking at 75 degrees and partly sunny, so we hope everybody can come out and join us. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Allison, appreciate it. Okay, I would ask Kim Wilson, is Kim Wilson with us? Kim, please come forward. Everyone, this is Kim Wilson, who is the superintendent of Tolls Career and Technical Center, and you are going to shortly be retired. Is that right? I am, yes. Well, we have a proclamation that we would like to present to you, and I will read that to you. Whereas in 2000, 2017 marks the 35th, oh, whoops, wrong proclamation. I was about ready to give you the Arthritis Foundation. <laughs> so, <laughs> let's not rush into that. You look very healthy. Uh, whereas the Toll Center and Tolls Career and Technical Center Superintendent Kim Wilson will retire on August 1st, 2017. And whereas Kim has led the district, which services students in Dublin, Fairbanks, Jonathan Alder, Hilliard, London, Madison Plains, and Jefferson Local Schools since 2011, after serving for eight years as the superintendent for the Ohio Point Career, High Point Career Center in Bell Fountain. And whereas Kim developed her passion for career and technical education as a student at Madeira? Madeira High School near Cincinnati, where she discovered a connection between classwork and bankable skills. And whereas at Tolls, Kim increased the focus on student performance and staff accountability and led efforts to increase opportunities for school level innovation, advance career technical opportunities for students outside of the Plain City campus, create district level efficiencies, increase brand awareness, and improve outreach efforts to increase student enrollment and retention. And whereas her leadership has led to improved performance on the state report card, in student performance measures, an increase in interest in programs and enrollment, enhancements in technology and professional development, and the addition of satellite programming. And whereas Tolls now offers 37 program areas in addition to rigorous academics and the opportunity to earn dual enrollment credit from local two and four year colleges and universities. And whereas under her leadership, Tolls enrollment has grown nearly 23% over the last five years. And whereas during Kim's tenure, Tolls expanded its offerings, including an information technology center at Dublin, Scioto High School, 
and using state grant funding installed a $3.5 million advanced robotics and manufacturing lab known as RamTech. Now, therefore, I, Gregory S. Peterson, Mayor of the City of Dublin, Ohio, on behalf of all of Dublin City Council, do hereby congratulate Kim Wilson on her retirement as Toll Superintendent and wish her all the best in the future, signed this 22nd day of May, 2017. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kim. Okay, I'd like to now ask Jeff Brayshares to come forward. Jeff, come on up. How are you this evening? Good, how are you? I'm doing just great, except I tried to give away your proclamation there a second. We thought it sounded familiar. <laughs> uh, tell us who you are and what you do with the Arthritis uh, Classic Auto Show Cruise In. Uh, I am Jeff Brashears, and we have been doing the Arthritis Foundation Classic Auto Show. This will be my 34th year of 35. My wife, uh, Angie, and my daughter, Abby, listen to me talk about this show every day of my life, 365 days a year. You think he's bad now. Wait till you get, he gets this back. <laughs> uh, just one second. All, the members of the committee who are here, would you stand up, please, for the Arthritis Foundation? Andy and, and uh, <clears throat> Katie have been with me almost from the beginning. Um, Steve's with the Mustang Club, Garrick with the BMWs, Joe Eigel's one of our traffic directors. We have a committee of 75 people that have put this on for 35 years. This is a fantastic fundraiser. Dublin has been extremely supportive. We started 35 years ago with a couple hundred cars. We have 1,200 cars now and we race $250,000 a year at this show for the Arthritis Foundation. That's fantastic. And I, it is important that we take time and, and recognize the efforts that you, you It's the committee. We have a phenomenal committee. So, uh, whereas 2017 marked the 35th anniversary of the Arthritis Foundation Classic Auto Show and Cruise In, and Jeff's 34th year chairing the event, taking over the reins from Len Emke after the inaugural show in 1982, and whereas the first show was held at Emke's Cadillac dealership on Sawmill Road, and showcased about three dozen cars. And whereas Jeff moved the show to Metro Place the following year and eventually expanded it to a second day featuring live entertainment on both nights. And whereas Friday's Cruisin', which will take place July 14th, 2017, now attracts nearly 1,000 cars and awards 106 foot tall trophies to the best of the best. <laughs> and the Saturday's Classic Auto Show now features more than 1,000 cars in nearly 50 classes covering virtually every make and type of car and truck with multiple awards presented in each class. And whereas, in addition to raising several million dollars to support the Arthritis Foundation's work in the local community as well as nationally, this show has brought thousands of cars and people to Dublin, filling countless hotel rooms and restaurants. And whereas in 2006, Jeff and his committee, in cooperation with the Dublin Chamber of Commerce, hosted an overnight stop in Dublin for the National Guard Great Race. And whereas, among his many honors, Jeff was presented with the Lee Iacocca Award for Dedication to Excellence and Perpetuating an American Automobile Tradition. And most recently, Jeff and his entire auto show committee were presented with the Arthritis Foundation's Champion, Champion Award given to the individual volunteers and volunteer groups who have demonstrated excellence in leadership and commitment to furthering the mission by leading, leading fundraising efforts, opening doors, building partnerships, engaging other volunteers, and championing the arthritis-related activities in their communities. And whereas Jeff is a Senior Vice President for Sales and National Accounts for TTS, having previously retired from Pacer International as Logistics Services Group President. And whereas for more than 20 years, Jeff has graciously provided classic cars for the City of Dublin's St. Patrick's Day and Independence Day parades, including cars for Dublin City Council members to ride in their parades. <laughs> or, or walk, Tim. Or walk, Tim. <laughs> he insists on walking. Now, therefore, I, Gregory S. Peterson, Mayor of the City of Dublin, Ohio, on behalf of all of Dublin City Council, on the occasion of his retirement as co-chairman of the Arthritis Foundation Classic Auto Show and Cruise In, do hereby congratulate Jeff on his outstanding commitment and dedication to our community signed this 22nd day of May, 2017.
Thank you very much. John, I know you've gone and judged, judged that. Yeah. yeah. So. You know what? It was awesome. By the way, um, I was really impressed. You talk about an impartial, well put together group. You guys flew in judges from other places around the United States of America to judge your cars. It was so professional. It was amazing. So my hat's off to you. I mean. No, thank you. And who's going to be your successor? Do we? Do Kevin we... Gadd is the uh, one of the co-chairmen this year, and he's going to. He's, his comment was, no matter who takes it over, it's going to be hard. And I said, we'll be right there with you. <laughs> great, great. Thank you very thank much you for what much. you do for our community. You know, while no longer with us, my neighbor was Jim Finn. And I know he served on the committee for a lot of years. I just like to acknowledge him. He passed far too young, so. Yeah. Okay, uh, we're moving on to the recognition of our outgoing city board and commission members. You know, one of the, um, we'll give them those folks a minute to clear out. Was it something you said? I, it must have been something I said. <laughs> As soon as that door closes, we're going to start talking about the Arthritis Foundation. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, one of the strengths of this community and this city council is the volunteer work of our board and commission members that come in and serve on our various boards and commissions. And for me, and I know I speak for all of city council, the quality of people in our community that step forward uh, and, and volunteer thankless hours and talents and strengths uh, is always uh, just an amazing resource that we have, and it's so important, the role that they play. And there are a number of them that will be, uh, that their time on serving on these boards and commissions is coming to a close, and they include, from the Community Services Advisory Commission, Warren Fishman, Jason McGarvey, and Kelly Lynn. From the Personnel Board of Review, Jim Renard. From the Board of Zoning Appeals, Brian Gano, And from the Architectural Review Board, Tom Moonhall. Um, I know that Warren is here. Warren, could you come up for a second? Nobody else showed up, Nobody else showed up Warren. <laughs> they were all intimidated by the shadow that you cast. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I doubt it. I doubt it. <laughs> you know, I, I think everyone that has had any kind of activity in the city of Dublin knows Warren Fishman. And Warren, when I read through the, the at least your resume with the city, uh, it is truly a remarkable resume. And I don't know of many people from the beginning of this community that can <laughs> boast the number of years that you have served this community in your unwavering dedication and commitment to this town and to these people that live here. Um, here's the words that they wrote that you have dedicated your time, talents, and passion for many years to making Dublin a better place to live. And that really is true. I think all of us have seen that in action, and that's not even on my piece of paper. But when you look at the number of years, 17 years as a member of the Planning and Zoning Commission, six years as a member of the Board of Zoning Appeals, two years as a member of the Bicycle Advisory Task Force, and then most recently serving two more years on the Community Services Advisory Commission, or CSAC, um, in, in your effort with the pianos in the park and the things that you have done, which you know, Dana always says we need to be leaning forward. Warren, you're always leaning forward. And I don't know of any single person that I know in this community that I can say has a more pure or pure commitment to what's good for this community than you. Uh, and we are tremendously blessed to have you here, uh, tremendously grateful. I am personally for what you've done for this community. I mean, there are things about our community that my kids benefit from because of Warren Fishman and what you've done and the commitment that you've shown to this town. Um, so I just want you to know that for me personally, and I'll give my colleagues an opportunity to express their appreciation uh, as well, but for me, Warren, you represent everything that's good about Dublin uh, and the community service and the tireless hours and, and don't worry, your check is in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> it's coming, Warren, and, you know, and the, the fact that it is all just done from the goodness of your heart um, is what makes it so special. And the, the product, all you need to do, Warren, is get in your car and drive around this community. And you can see what impact that you have had. So personally, I want to thank you for that. And I'll turn it over to John. Well, Warren, I can't think of any other person that has done more 
for this community than you. I think people realize that your years on P&Z, you created wealth by creative land use. And this city is strong and financially sound because of you. You cut down or improved those projects were, that were tax drain for us and encouraged development that was beautiful and beneficial to our city. You are the apex of citizen involvement. All the citizens here, past, present, and future, owe you a debt of thanks. And, I, and we all do. So thank you. Okay. And we do. Excuse me. Well, no, sure. I, 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 just, I, just, I served with Warren on, for five years in the Planning and Zoning Commission. I, th I think we both served um, at the same time together. But um, if, if you like the water features in town, thank Warren. <laughs> I mean, I, I, don't, I, I, don't, I don't think there was an application that we heard um, you know, where Warren didn't say, if there wasn't water, there should be water, and if there was water, there should be more. So anyway, thank you, Warren. You forgot about brick. <laughs> Warren, we don't have that much time, but I, I just, th that was the best story I could think of. And Warren, well, obviously, we're all in great debt to all the time that you've spent, and we need to thank your family for sharing you with us. But we're having all these accolades and talking about your contributions as if they're in the past, and I really hope that that's not the case. I'm guessing that you're not just going to go home and put your feet up and retire. Probably I, not. I hope not. I hope not. Warren, we've known each other for quite a while. There's nobody I know in the city that has as much passion and drive and energy that, that you have. And, and I appreciate your service. And probably more importantly, I appreciate your friendship. So thank you. I appreciate it, too. I'd like to thank you. We served on Planning and Zoning Commission together, I think, for eight years. Uh, and. Uh, always, you always had value to add, and I certainly appreciate your participation and all of the thoughts that you had and the patience that you, uh, you were there when I was first chair, and uh, the patience that you exuded upon me, I certainly do appreciate it. So I've probably known you the shortest amount of time um, from my colleagues up here, but probably have um, some of the biggest reasons to be thankful for you and for B. Um, I wouldn't be sitting here today with without you know your words of wisdom and and some a lot of guidance that that both you and B and, and some others gave me and so I'm, I'm internally grateful for that um, to have you know this honor and this opportunity to serve the community that I love and you know you were instrumental in that I can't thank you enough um, the more that I've learned about you the more in awe I am of your level of civic engagement and your level of commitment to civic duty to the city. So thank you. Thank you very much from the bottom of my heart for everything that you do, for everything that B does. We, could, we couldn't be here without you. Especially if cooking stinky. <laughs> well, Warren, you know. Okay, I just want to say that I, real quick, briefly, sure, as you know how no. brief I usually am, <laughs> <laughs> that, that those are wonderful accolades, but this is a great city, and there's a lot of great people in it. That, that made this the great city, and I'm just a small part of that. Um, uh, I got so lucky um, when I was, I was given a promotion with my company in 1968, 72, 1972, and they gave me a choice of five cities to go to. One was San, uh, San Diego, one was Boston. They were great cities, and B said, what the heck, let's just go back to Columbus. And, and, and so, so we did, and if we hadn't done that, obviously, I wouldn't have discovered Dublin. And Dublin's been fantastic. I've gotten a lot more out of Dublin than I've given, and I want to continue to give. And so it's a great place, and there's a lot of great people here. So that's what made the city, not me, but a lot of great people. So thank you. Well, Warren, you are certainly top shelf, and we have a pewter clock here from Ireland. Maybe you can put it on your top shelf. Except this is a small token of our appreciation. <laughs> a broken clock. <laughs> it's right twice a day. Hey, Warren. Warren, this, this clock might be small, but to you and us, you deserve Big Ben. Okay. That's Thank the, you. Thank you.
Well, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention, you know, the old saying behind every great <laughs> man there stands a strong woman. B, you are just as important of a pillar to this community. So thank you for everything that you do as well. There is no question Warren married way, way above himself. So, <laughs> but thank you to all our all of our outgoing boards and commission members. Okay, the Citizen U graduate, Christine. Right. Okay, so I have this little thing here to read. So for the past eight weeks, 17 citizens have spent many hours with our staff during Citizen University, otherwise known as Citizen U. This is our third year producing this academy, which is a look behind the curtain designed to increase our community's understanding of our form of government, its financial structure, our innovative strategies, and most importantly, the people who serve our city on a day-to-day -day basis. It is a fantastic learning experience and great exchange among citizens and public, and we thank each citizen for making the commitment to Dublin through this kind of engagement and look forward to their continued relationship with and service to the city. One of the graduate, graduates, Bobby Jo Allen, was chosen by her fellow, you must have drawn the short straw, Bobby Jo, um, to say a few words. Uh, Bobby Jo, please. Thank you very much. My name is Bobby Jo Allen. I'm a happy Dublin resident of three years in the Muirfield community. Also would like to invite my fellow class members to stand for recognition quickly. Please do. You can tell we're the ones with the green shirt. Just a few quick remarks about our experience with this program. Reflecting upon the eight weeks brought to mind one of my favorite podcasts, which is called 99% Invisible. And the idea behind 99% Invisible is within the built environment, so cities and architecture and spaces and objects. Most of what you experience, you don't actually notice. It's all behind the scenes. And that really came true to life throughout this class in particular. Few things in particular that I wanted to call out that we've learned. The first is that Dublin really is a great destination for businesses, large and small, and the work that you all collectively as city council, as well as the supporting members, uh, the, the, the employees of the city of Dublin, do a tremendous amount to attract corporate businesses, small and large. Not necessarily something that we see on a day-to-day -day basis as residents, but we know that, that it really enriches the fabric of our community by making it both not only a destination for residents, but also for cities as well. Had no idea about things like Dublink and things like the development community. And it was interesting that it's easy to look at groups like IT infrastructure and, and think about how they would relate to attracting businesses, but it really is collectively the work that the city does overall to make Dublin an attractive place for businesses to come and to come and reside. The second thing was about the power of planning. And so I did a little Wikipedia work in advance of this night and saw that over the last 25 years, Dublin has grown from about 16,000 to about 45,000 residents, which is about for a 4% compound annual growth rate, which is really tremendous growth at a time period when for Ohio as a whole, growth rate during that time was about flat, and the city of Columbus was about 1%. And so if you think about the, t the, the stress that that kind of growth would have on infrastructure and how we as residents don't really feel a lot of that stress and everything seems to work very seamlessly, it just goes to, to show the power of planning and the infrastructure planning and the master planning that you all have done, which has been very successful and allowed Dublin to be such a great place to live. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention was a city in service to its residents. And on the very first class we, you shared with us, uh, or the organizational structure for the city council and for all of the departments that support the city. And at the very top are the residents of Dublin. And it doesn't go unnoticed to us that we are at the top of that organizational structure. And it's clear that all of you collectively and the employees of the city as well spend tremendous amount of time and effort in service to the residents who live here. And in particular, I wanted to call out how, as we went through all of the weeks of the class and met all of these city employees, the pride that each of them feel in the work that they do, and also the accountability that they clearly hold to the residents of the city was truly remarkable and really great experience. So in conclusion, we've learned tons 
about all the work that it takes to run a city, about what it's like to run one of the snow plows and keep the streets clear, which we were all really excited to learn more about that piece of it. The cornerstone of fiscal responsibility, which clearly comes through, and how careful you are with tax dollars is very important to call out as well. 99% um, of what you do may well, in fact, be invisible. And I'm guessing that you're more likely to hear from residents when things maybe aren't going well from their perspective rather than when they are. But you know, these are the things that we've taken away. But what we wanted to share with you was our appreciation for all that you do for the city of Dublin and making it such a great place to live. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Robin. You know, and having the opportunity to talk to the Citizen U graduates over the years, it is, it always amazes me. Almost 100% of the graduates come away with a tremendous feeling of pride about the city. Almost no one comes away thinking, well, yeah, but that department really was falling short, or oh my goodness, that was an awful experience. Everyone comes away with a sense of pride, and that's a really a, a remarkable thing. So thank you very much, and thank you for everybody participating in that project. Uh, Colleen, we're moving on to Economic Development Week. Maybe you and your team can come forward. You know, as Bobby Joe had mentioned, that the economics and the economy of this community and the economic development is what is the fuel that drives this entire engine. Uh, and I think all of us know that, and we greatly appreciate everything that you do in that regard, and your team, and you play such a critical role that we have named a whole week after you guys. Uh, the Economic Development Week is an event designed by the International Economic Development Council to increase awareness of the local programs, create jobs, and advance career development opportunities, increase the quality of life in communities around the world. So I have a proclamation here that recognizes May 8th through, or May 8th through the 13th of this year as Economic Development Week. So thank you. Do you want to make any comment about this? I, I don't know if I could follow. That was well, so, I, so beautifully a about it. <laughs> act to follow. Uh, you know, my, my team's fantastic. We work hard every day. Um, it is behind the scenes quite a bit, uh, filling buildings and working with businesses to make sure that we can solve problems. So uh, it's something that we all love to do, and uh, we're very lucky to do it in a community that's very supportive of it. So thank you. Well, and you do it exceptionally well. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. And finally, Megan, it is also National Public Works Week, May 21st through the 27th. Um, you know, the citizens, you graduate, I, the timing was perfect because you commented on the things that drive our community. And it is your guys' service to our residents that is the front line. That's what, if, if, if you know, what people, uh, respond to and react to and understand about Dublin is overwhelmingly between chief and his officers and you guys and your service. That is what people interact with the most. So we greatly appreciate that. And so we've named this whole work week. Uh, public work services providing our community is an integral part of citizens' everyday lives. And so it will be National Public Works Week, May 21st through the 27th of this year. So do you have any comment to make about your guys and just very briefly, I do have three of my division heads present with us tonight. I have Rob James, who's the Director of Street and Utilities Operations, Daryl Seiler, Director of Fleet Management, Paul Hammersmith, Director of Engineering, and then Brian Ashford couldn't be with us. He's the um, facilities manager. These guys do a great job leading their teams. We have a team of dedicated 104 team members in the department. This is a national event and it couldn't be more timely for Dublin as all of our team members are preparing the city for the global stage with the Memorial Tournament. So it's a busy time. We also are heading into construction season. So it is a very fitting time and we thank the public and city council for your support. Well, thank you very much, mate. Megan, I've got a couple of traffic lights I want to talk to you about later. Okay. 
And, and, and Megan, um, just coincidentally in our packet this week um, was a note about uh, the Dublin fleet being among the 100 best fleets in North America. I believe it says that Dublin has the 21st best fleet on the continent, um, a recognition administered by the 100 best fleets in North America. The program recognizes and rewards peak performing fleet operations and encourages ever increasing standards within the fleet industry. And finally, Dublin is the only Ohio city to have made the list. So congratulations. Fantastic. I have to add that, if you don't mind, that that's, that's also competing with private sector fleets, which is it really me particularly wow. proud. Yeah. Good. Outstanding. Unbelievable. OK, moving on to the consent agenda, or is there any member of council that would like for any of these eight items to be removed? I would just point out real quick that the tax budget fiscal year 2018 and the medical marijuana cultivation will come back at the June 12th council meeting. If That's anybody correct. would have signed in, we're happy to let people comment tonight. If not, there will be a public hearing on June 12th. Does anybody want to remove any of those eight items? Hearing none, I will make a motion that we approve the entire consent agenda. Is there a second? Second. second. Judy? Ms. Taylor? Yes. Mr. Lucklider? Yes. Vice Mayor Reiner? Yes. Mr. Keenan? Yes. Ms. Saluda? Yes. Mayor Peterson? Yes. Ms. Samuels Cruz? Yes. Second reading public hearing ordinances, ordinance 25-17, Judy. Dana? Uh, no change from Angel's presentation at your last meeting. Any questions from council? Any discussion? Yes. 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 Okay. Staff presentation will cover the next three ordinances, 26, 27, and 28 17. All three titles will be read prior to the presentation, and the vote will be taken separately. So, Judy, as to all three of those ordinances. Let me read the titles. Ordinance 2617, accepting the annexation of 47.366 acres from Jerome Township, Union County, to the City of Dublin. Agent Tom Hart, Attorney Agent for Petitioners, Johnston H. Means, R. Oliver Griffith, and Deborah L. Griffith. Ordinance 2717, rezoning approximately 47 acres from our rural district to PUD Plan Unit Development District for the development of the site with 73 single-family lots and approximately 20 acre, 21 acres of open space on the east side of Highland Cry Road, north of the intersection of Park Mill Drive under the provisions of Zoning Code Section 153.050, and a preliminary plat for 73 single-family lots, rights of way, and open space in accordance with Chapter 152, the subdivision regulations. And then Ordinance 2817, authorizing the city manager to enter into an infrastructure agreement with Pulte Homes of Ohio for the Autumn Rose Woods development. Okay, so moving back to then to staff presentation, Nikki. Absolutely. Good evening, mayors and members of council. Uh, before you this evening, uh, we have three ordinances as mentioned for Autumn Rose Woods. Ordinance 2617, 2717, and 2817. Uh, this is a joint effort uh, between the law director's office, uh, the city engineer, and planning this evening. Um, I will be presenting the first two ordinances, and Paul Hammersmith, the city engineer, will be um, helping me with the infrastructure component this evening. As mentioned, uh, the site is located on the east side of Highland Quarry Road. Um, it has approximately 1,000 feet of frontage. It is comprised of two parcels, both currently located within Jerome Township in Union County. The southern parcel is the existing um, Autumn Rose Horse Farm uh, with single-family residents as well as paddocks. The site to the north uh, contains a single-family residence, uh, which is proposed to stay uh, with this development. 
The annexation request is for 47.366 acres. This includes no public rights of way. Uh, as council may recall, uh, the city entered into a pre-annexation agreement with Pulte Homes, Ordinance 2816. As part of that, it provided for the concurrent review of the annexation as well as the rezoning and preliminary development plan uh, before council this evening. Um, and the infrastructure component has been included with this as well. Staff is recommending approval um, of the annexation to city council this evening. With respect to the rezoning and preliminary development plan, the community plan um, identifies uh, recommendations uh, for sites within the city. This site is designated mixed residential rural transition and recommends uh, single family homes on smaller lots at a density of 1.5 dwelling units to the acre. The proposal is consistent with that at 1.54 dwelling units to the acre, and that is um, with the intent of preserving the um, natural areas on the site. Additionally, the thoroughfare plan um, identifies uh, recommended right-of-way widths. The city engineer has worked with the Uni Union County engineer, um, as Highland Croy Road is not currently within uh, the municipal boundary of the city of Dublin and uh, has provided enough right-of-way dedication to uh, fulfill the future vision uh, for the Highland Croy Road corridor. Furthermore... Excuse me, Nikki, if I could. I, I apologize for the interruption. That, that was one of the questions that I had um, with respect to right-of-way. I think that there was um, something in the memo uh, to the effect that um, there's, there's not right-of-way included. Did, did I misunderstand? Uh, correct. So there is no right-of-way included with the annexation request. So the annexation is uh, only for the 47.366 acres that is the site. Okay. So you, you, you explain this to me, please. So for improvements to, right of, to the Highland Quarry Road that are required as part of the development, that's in the infrastructure agreement, so that's Union County, Dublin, and the developer will provide for those turn-ins that are required and some of those off-site contributions that Pulte will be required to make as a result of the development impact. But the annexation petition itself is only for the parcel up to the right-of-way line. Okay. But through another mechanism, then, we're getting, we, will, we will get the right-of-way that we need to eventually widen the road to four lanes? Correct. We have provision for right-of-way dedication, and that's either to Dublin or Union County as applicable when the right-of-way is required. Okay. Thank you. At no cost. And that will also include the uh, corridor setback, which we have already established on that road, right? So Correct. we've got enough room for the four lanes, the center medium. Yep and the setback. Correct. Correct. Okay. The uh, development text has provided um, to fulfill this rural roadway character designation, which the community plan um, identifies for Highland Croy, which is that variable setback from 100 to 200 feet. Um, in this development, it'll be 150. Okay. Thank you. Um, yes. As mentioned, the community plan also identifies special area plans. Um, for sensitive sites within the city. Um, these are simply con conceptual depictions of how development could occur. Um, the proposal before council this evening is uh, fairly consistent with the area plan's vision for this site in that it does preserve a significant amount of woods, does provide that setback along Highland Cry Road, and um, also provides uh, single-family residences adjacent to um, existing single-family residences. The proposed preliminary development plan before council tonight is for 73 single-family lots. That's 72 new lots, as well as the preservation um, of one existing home on a 73rd lot. Uh, the site will develop in two sections with 37 lots being developed with phase one um, and 36 lots in phase two. Additionally, uh, stubs uh, will be connected to the north and south, as well as uh, five public streets created 
um, and 21 acres of open space across six reserves. 16 of that, uh, 16 of those acres will be contiguous within Reserve C in the woods. With respect to the proposed uses and development standards, these are consistent uh, with uh, recently approved single family subdivisions um, throughout Dublin. It will permit uh, parks, open space, uh, homes, and then also the uses within the R1 um, section of the zoning code. Uh, the applicant has also provided uh, 21.3 acres of open space, all to be dedicated to the city of Dublin. Reserves A, B, and F, as shown on the screen, uh, will be maintained by the Homeowners Association and will contain uh, landscaping features, entry features, um, as well as bike paths. Reserves C, E, and D will be maintained by the city. These will contain um, natural features, wetlands, and stormwater management facilities. The, the proposed preliminary plat is also included with this request and delineates um, uh, lines that are described within the development text. The Planning and Zoning Commission reviewed this application at their May 2nd or March 2nd meeting. Um, at that meeting, they recommended approval to City Council with the seven conditions on the screen. Uh, the applicant has worked with staff to fulfill all the conditions. Additionally, they have filled all the, fulfilled all the conditions with the preliminary plat as well. Staff is recommending approval of Ordinance 2717 as well as the preliminary plat. Good evening, members of council. I'll cover the infrastructure agreement portion. Um, the execution of an inf infrastructure agreement is a condition of approval recommended by the Planning and Zoning Commission for the rezoning and the preliminary development plan process. Um, the most critical component of the infrastructure agreement is the traffic impact study, which establishes and determines the impacts to the associated transportation network adjacent to the site and then also determines the mitigating measures uh, as a result of those impacts. The developer, Pulte Homes, commissioned a traffic impact study which was completed in May of 2016 and then uh, just recently updated in February. The TIS uh, looked at a 10-year period starting in 2016 to 2026 in terms of the impacts and those are really our horizon years. So most importantly, what was looked at and determined from the traffic impact study were first that um, required by the developer to construct it at 100% of their cost would be southbound left turn lane into the site on Highland Croy Road and a northbound right turn lane on Highland Croy into the site. And then further off-site contributions would be necessary at three critical intersections, Highland Croy and Brand Road where we have an existing roundabout, Highland Croy Road and Park Mill Drive where we would need future intersection control, and then further to the south, Highland Croy Road and Post Road. From that traffic impact study, we first looked at the contributing traffic to those intersections. And as a result of that contribution of traffic, we did do an estimate of the improvement necessary in the future uh, to mitigate uh, their impacts at those intersections. What you see first is the identified intersection in the table in front of you. Um, next, the uh, improvement estimate, the contribution of site traffic, and then what their contribution would be towards that future improvement. So Highland Croy Road and Park Mill Drive, uh, at some point either, um, like I said, a higher level of intersection control at an estimate of a million dollars at 3% of contributed traffic, $30,000 of improvement. Highland Croy Road and Post Road, uh, a $250,000 or $2.5 million improvement, 1.7% of the traffic, uh, site generated traffic at that intersection for a result of $42,500 uh, worth of contribution. And then lastly, um, the Highland Croy Road, Brand Road, Mitchell DeWitt Roundabout was always constructed several years ago to be expandable. Uh, there wouldn't be necessary to have a future expansion of that roundabout. Again, 1.7% uh, that happens to be just coincidental uh, from the traffic impact study with a resulting uh, $8,500 contribution for a total of $81,000 in uh, mitigating contributions.
the contributions themselves will be made actually in two phases as the, as the project develops. The first phase would be 37 homes, and then the second phase will be 36 homes. Um, the first contribution to be made will be for the intersection at Highland Croy and Post Road. Um, that'll be at the time of the final plat uh, for that first phase. And then the second two contributions at Highland Croy and Park Mill and then Highland Croy and Brand Road would be made at the time of recording of the, uh, the final plat for the second phase or December 31st of 2025, whichever is earlier. Another important component of the infrastructure agreement um, addresses what Mr. Licklider brought up, which is the jurisdictional um, boundaries and, and who controls the intersections presently. Uh, the intersections of Highland Croy Road and Park Mill Drive are, and also at Post Road are currently controlled by the Union County Engineer's Office. If those intersections happen to be annexed into the future, those contributions would then come to Dublin, and then um, otherwise they will be paid to Union County. Um, the infrastructure agreement itself is consistent with the findings of the traffic impacts, impact study uh, and mutually agreed upon by, by both myself and also the Union County Engineer. Uh, staff does recommend approval of this infrastructure agreement this evening, and I'll be get, glad to answer any questions you might have. Mm -hmm. Council, any questions of our staff first? Paul, um, on the bicycle trail that runs across the shared youth path, mm -hmm. is that paid for by the developer? Yeah, any of the shared use paths, both along the frontage of Highland Croy Road, and then there will be a connector to Park Place, will be the responsibility of the developer. Thank you. Tim? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I had a couple questions for Nikki, please. Okay. Certainly. N Nikki, w with respect to uh, uh, the homeowner responsibility to maintain Reserve A and the cul de sac, and, and then there's a, there's a third reserve they're maintaining, mm -hmm. I believe that we have a formula. Um, that, that we apply, you know, that roughly determines, um, you know, whether the maintenance responsibility uh, uh, results in a burden or not. You know, I know we've had some neighborhoods that, that um, you know, haven't been able to, to really reasonably sustain the open space. So was that applied here? Um, it, was, it was taken into consideration, the burden um, on the HOA um, in our work with the developer. Um, in the past, um, the city has, this land has always always been dedicated to the city, so the city um, will cover the tax burden of that property. Um, typically, the frontage um, where a private landscape feature or entry feature would be located is um, always maintained by the city of Dublin, or always maintained by the HOA. Um, since the stormwater management is not in that area, um, that is why uh, staff is supportive of the HOA. Um, and comfortable with them being able to financially be able to maintain that. There is a forced and funded HOA um, required as part of the development text. But, but, but staff believes that's a reasonable burden to spread across just 72 units. I mean, that's, that's a significant open space there, mm -hmm. obviously. Um, and then in terms of landscaping, do you know, I mean, I know to the south of there, um, Post Preserve and Park Place, I mean, the landscaping plan there, the original one included a lot of trees that virtually a significant number, if not all of them, have ended up being replaced. Essentially, the city has subsidized that, you know, through our um, beautification grants. Mm -hmm. yes. So yes, we're, we're not going to make that mistake again. We will not, and we've already talked to the developer about that, actually. There's been kind of a change in mindset. A lot of those treatments along Highland Croy Road came out of the <coughs> Rate of Wow right. um, plan. Um, and they were formalized Bosque treatments, and unfortunately, they didn't do well in that more naturalized rural corridor. Um, so the neighborhoods to the north and south have transitioned or are working toward transitioning to a more rural character, um, and that's uh, the direction that staff has given the applicant um, to be finalized with the final development plan. Good. And, and then finally, with respect to that, that particular reserve, I hope there's not going to be a fence included uh, there. I, I'm, in, in, in my experience, the fences never work long term. You know, we've got one along Brand Road right now, you know, that, that had slats missing for a considerable amount of time. Now they've been replaced and they're unpainted. Um, you know, so that's just one example. Um, I, fences, even if they're made of synthetic materials, you know, I don't think hold up well over time. 
Yeah, with respect to the entry, um, I would defer to the applicant on that. The only fence that is proposed as part of this application is uh, fences that already exist, and those uh, will only be maintained between uh, budding single-family residential uh, lots. Okay. Well, and then and then there's also language, um, you know, with respect to the initial funding, um, or 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 when the the maintenance responsibility shifts to the HOA. I mean, obviously, in the early years, if we sell 10 units, 20 units, whatever else. You know the HOA can't um, bear that burden, so we, we've got language in there. When that transfers, it's it's a certain number of homes being sold or something like that. To my we'll knowledge, let, we'll, I let don't the, we'll let yeah we'll let the applicant address that. I don't know that we've yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Any other questions of staff? I see Mr. Hart is here. Tom, you want to yeah. comment? Really quickly, uh, if council doesn't mind, I'd like to summarize. Uh, the council motion recommendations prior to uh, Mr. Hart's uh, presentation. Uh, staff is recommending approval of all three ordinances before you this evening. Um, also, um, as staff has worked through the infrastructure agreement um, with the applicant, um, it's become apparent through timing that um, the conversation of tree preservation and um, a waiver um, to some of the requirements may be more appropriate to have um, concurrently uh, with this request for annexation, rezoning, and infrastructure agreement this evening. Um, so staff has also um, prepared slides on that uh, for council's consideration, um, which uh, Ms. Husak will be presenting on, um, given her work on the citywide uh, policy. I forgot I need to give Nikki a break since this was her first council presentation. I thought she did amazing. <laughs> so. Yes, she did. Um, we... As you know, are working on an update to the tree waiver policy, and the applicant is um, caught a little bit in the timing of that particular work that we are doing. We did have an original uh, um, a review at the Planning and Zoning Commission last Thursday night of our um, of our um, updated waiver policy, and we are hoping to get that to you for review um, at your June 12th meeting. In the meantime, though, the applicant has requested discussion tonight on um, a waiver of the tree replacement fees in terms of the original policy that is in place today. So we wanted to um, have a quick discussion on that and see if council might find it appropriate to include that in your um, review of the preliminary development plan tonight and have this potentially be part of the development text for this particular uh, proposal in the future. On the slide there, you see the um, wooded area, which is kind of shaded in that gray color, um, that the applicant is proposing to preserve as part of this development. And um, there is about 10% of that area that is being removed as part of this proposal with this cul-de-sac and those lots that are proposed within um, that roadway. And the trees in the dark color here are indicating landmark trees that are being uh, proposed for removal as part of this proposal. And as you know, we typically show you the waiver request in a, um, in a table that shows what um, on the right side the waiver would do versus what um, tree replacement per the zoning code would entail for any kind of development. And we always differentiate between the non-landmark trees, which is that first row, and the landmark trees. So the landmark trees are all trees that are healthy and fair and good condition that are 24 inches and above in diameter. And the non-landmark trees are any trees that are 24 inches below and up to six inches and are also in healthy, fair, or good condition. So for this proposal, we are um, looking at a removal of 173 non-landmark trees or 1,910 inches and a removal of six healthy landmark trees, or a total of 169 inches. If the applicant were required to replace those inches um, per the code, which would be an inch-for-inch inch replacement, it would be a um, replacement of 2,700, no, I'm sorry, 2,079 inches. 
and um, the code requires replacement with two and a half inch trees minimum, which would be a total of 832 trees. So seeing the open spaces that the applicant is providing and also the discussion you just had on the maintenance of those open spaces and the uh, maintenance of the HOA for open spaces where replacement trees would be located, um, there really isn't a reasonable way for the applicant to replace um, 832 trees on site. Um, so if the applicant were to choose to pay a fee in lieu of the replacement of those inches, the fee would be $200,079. Um, $200, and um, so the waiver, what typically council has done in the past is to allow non-landmark trees to be be replaced inch for inch, uh, tree for tree. I always get that wrong, I'm so sorry. Um, tree for tree as opposed to inch for inch. So that is our um, last column here. So instead of replacing 832 inches, um, the allowance would be to replace 241 um, trees at two and a half inches each. Um, the applicant in their plans currently, and again, we are not at the final development plan stage, but at the stage that we are at right now, the applicant is proposing to replace half of those um, required inches with trees. So they are showing that they can replace 301 inches with 121 trees across all the open spaces, all the reserves within the development. And then they would pay a fee in lieu of the remainder, which would be um, exactly $30,000. And that is the waiver request before you today, which is essentially this um, bottom box right here. Without the waiver, the fee to be paid would be $177,000 and 750. Um, so in looking at, uh, at the preservation of a significant amount of the woodlands on the site, a removal of 5% of landmark trees and saving 95% of landmark trees on the, on the site. Um, staff really felt that this was a, a quite unique situation that this um, the site presents, um, as well as that there have been a lot of efforts made for preservation and that um, the applicant is replacing according to what is available in land for replacement trees. So we don't want to plant it so heavily that it can't be either maintained by the city or maintained by the HOA. So with that, our recommendation would be to have um, two conditions added to the um, seven conditions that we had originally sent to the Planning and Zoning Commission and that the Planning and Zoning Commission um, recommended for approval. We would request that council consider these two additional conditions which would be that the development text be modified to permit tree for tree replacement for non-landmark trees with the minimum of the 301 and a half inches to be replaced on site and that the applicant would work with staff to ensure that if there's room for any additional inches they would provide them on site as well um, and to ensure that long-term survivability of these replacement trees is, is indeed happening. Um, so with that, we are all obviously here to entertain any of your questions, and the applicant certainly is as well. Thank you. I could ask you a quick question, Claudia. Yes, please. This, with the, this being the pre-annexation, this is still in Jerome Township, is there anything that would prevent these people from going out and cutting every single tree down right now? Just political will. <laughs> Does anybody have questions for council before we turn it over to Tim? Um, the 173 trees, uh, you showed us the cul-de-sac where the six landmark trees mm -hmm. are, are proposed to be removed. But the, the 173 trees, can you just, can you give us, I mean, they may not be identified anywhere, but can, I mean, <coughs> marked like the landmark trees were, but can, with a pointer or something, can you tell me generally where yeah. those are? Um, certainly. There is, um, there are woods where um, the stormwater management pond has to be accommodated. So you see some of these smaller dots here. So are there, there are trees here. And then where the cul-de-sac is, even though the landmark trees are indicated, it is a wooded site. And it's 173 trees that are non-landmark. But if you look at what they're totaling in inches, is 1,910 inches. They're not six-inch trees. They're still substantial trees that 179 equates, um, they just don't rise to the landmark status. Okay, so we're not proposing the, re the removal of any trees along this fence rows, either north or south? 
Um, this is intended to be preserved. We had actually requested the applicant to move um, utilities south more in toward the lots to ensure um, survivability of those fence row trees. Because I, 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 consume, I assume the concern of you know, the existing homeowners you know, is going to be the preservation of, of those trees and the fence row and so forth. And I'm assuming there have been uh, you folks, the developers, had meetings with the, yes. the neighborhoods. Absolutely. And um, uh, planning staff, engineering staff, as well as Parks and Rec staff all walked the site with the applicant as well. And um, we really had looked at um, verifying the survey that we had and also where trees are really worth preserving within this area. Okay, thank you. We're uh, revisiting the tree waiver process. Do you have an update on when we might expect completion? We're hoping to bring this to you at your next meeting, at, um, at the June 12th meeting. We had some comments at Planning and Zoning Commission that requires us to do a little bit more um, work on the policy, but we're still hoping to be on track for your 12th of June meeting. So there, you know, part of what I think makes this one unique and special is, you know, they're dedicating better than 35% of the property to the green space. Um, you know, just that chunk there is about 35% of of the entire property. So it's significantly more than what we typically see in any of the developments. Is, is that right? Um, it is more in terms of, um, we've had a few that did um, in the 40s um, recently. In terms of what the code would require them to dedicate, it is 6% and they're in the 40s. Gotcha, thank you. I think it's worth noting that, as you mentioned, that this is a woods that's really worth preserving. There's a lot of beautiful large trees in it, and um, sometimes the total is greater than that of the parts. And I think this wood uh, is just that. I think that it has tremendous value, and it's certainly worth preserving to the best of our ability because of the quality of the plant material that's contained there. Any other questions from council directed at staff? Hearing none, Tom. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, good evening. Um, I'm Tom Hart, my address is 2 Miranova Place in Columbus. With me tonight are Matt Callahan from Pulte Homes and also Greg Chillog of the Edge Group, our landscape architect. I wanna thank Nikki and Claudia for their reports and um, certainly Paul and Jennifer for working with us um, through a lot of detail on a lot of different uh, parts pieces during this process. Um, we did have two neighborhood meetings. We did have two planning commission meetings, one as a really a concept plan hearing way, way up front, and then a, a recent one. And then we, we, um, we did get input from members of council on this plan. Um, we feel good about how we incorporated that input. We do feel like we listened. Um, and put together a plan that really balances what we know is a surging market demand for empty nester housing um, in Dublin, you know, along with Dublin's, Dublin's high expectations and high development standards. Um, this plan, I think as the staff report um, detailed, meets the code. It meets Dublin's architectural standards. It complies with the community plan in terms of density, um, wooded preservation, multi-use path connections, open space requirements, and, and the large setbacks along Highland Quarry Road. Again, we tried hard to respect the community plan and, and the, uh, uh, the future land use plan uh, with the significant preservation on the site. And we, when we did, again, try to listen very hard to the neighborhood um, and come up with the least impactful plan I do think when um, a key moment in this process is when we uh, made the decision to try to uh, structure the site as an empty nester product, um, that was something the neighborhood um, was, was strongly supportive of and, and something we heard um, it, it, it during council meetings. So just to be clear, we're, um, we're producing a 72 unit uh, in terms of new, new homes with mainly first floor living. These are large ranch. Um, patio style homes, um, all of them have a, you know, a master on the main or an owner suite down. Um, many, of, many of them offer a second bedroom down. Um, they're designed to have some flexible finished space on the second floor, um, but really that space is limited to, to, to really 50% of the first floor. So these are ranch homes. 
um, designed to um, uh, hit that market segment that, it, that, is, that we know is in, in high demand of people, of people my age, um, in fact. Uh, I, I think, you know, it's been, it's been alluded to, um, we're, we're at 45% open space with 21 acres of open space. Um, if, if I may, Mr. Mayor, to address the, the, the tree waiver request, um, we, we are, I think Claudia and Nikki, or Claudia hit the numbers, we're saving 90% of the woods overall at 16.6 .6 acres out of 18.5. Um, and those, those guys did a nice job walking through the details of, of our replacement and, and potential fee in lieu of. The bottom line on the tree issue and the tree um, replacement is that we're, we're trying to present what we believe is a significant public benefit to protecting 16 plus acres of, of very mature woods um, and really allow access to those woods for the first time. I think, I think through our meetings with, with the neighbors, there was a recognition that we, we are essentially guaranteeing the preservation of the woods you know, for their use for the first time because they don't have that use and they don't have that guarantee today. And I think that, um, that did garner support. Um, the bottom line, though, is when you set aside that much acreage on, on a development site and you also consider the, the, um, the setback off of Highland Croy, the development envelope on the site is very small. It's very shrunk and, shrunken and compact um, if you're going to save the woods and respect, respect that right away on, or that setback uh, distance on Highland Croy. So what... You know, the application of the ordinance in its, in its normal course would, would operate um, in a situation where we, we, we couldn't do this. We couldn't um, carry out this development at that level of fee um, in addition to, you know, some of, the, some of the regional road improvements that Greg um, worked with us on. And, 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 and you know, I, again, I want to thank, um, I'm sorry, Paul, I said Greg, Paul Hammersmith, worked with us on that development agreement to give us some flexibility in terms of when um, the, the regional improvement fees are due and when we make our improvements. Um, this kind of site doesn't have the same kind of impact as a normal traditional single family housing development that has kids and soccer practice and lots of trips and vehicles every day. But, you know, um, Paul's got a plan in place for uh, the thoroughfare and, and for the community improvement. We know we have a corridor that's, that's going to grow in, in traffic, and we are, um, we are paying into that and supporting that, you know, based on our traffic study. And so the combination of those, those factors means that um, led us to, to request the waiver and, and try to get a read on the waiver at the zoning because we really can't qualify what we have here um, and the feasibility of this development without, without knowing, you know, what, what, um, you know, what level of, of waiver would be supported. So with that, Mr. Mayor, I'll try to, we'll try to address any questions. You so you could, and I guess then, uh, Jen, th these additional conditions will be part of Ordinance 27-17? Correct, the rezoning. Okay, so mm -hmm. if we added those conditions, you'd be okay with that? Yes, sir. Does any of, anybody, thank you, Mr. Hart, does anybody have any questions for Mr. Hart? Okay, then I will. Excuse me. Oh, go ahead. I'm yeah. sorry, Tim. You, you heard the comment about the fence. I'd prefer not to see a fence. <laughs> Don't put. You it know, in. even in the entryway. I mean, they're just you know stone brick. You know, something other than a fence that just you know becomes a burden on the HOA. That they, they, you know, I'd like to see something that that is more sustainable long term. And, and I assume you're you're talking about the entry along Highland Croy. Correct. Is your main? Oh, yes, sir. Correct. So, yeah. Yeah, we had not planned for that. But, Great. But we'll. Definitely take that under consideration with our final uh, details. Appreciate it. I know I've made that comment a number of times before. I don't know the extent to which I, I'm just one person, you know, but uh, whether that the extent to which that's taken to heart by our planning staff and uh, very much taken to heart. They they really um, educated us on the history and how some of the traditional type landscaping really doesn't stand up to the wind and the weather on, on you know on the Great Flat Plain, you know, coming from Nebraska. The, the, the stuff that's been put out in, in some of the developments in the, in the past at entries along there have been hammered by the weather and had and they, they were very clear about that and 
we're trying to do something that's more uh, natural to the prairie environment, you know, to the prairie environment that once was, um, and it is pretty low impact, low maintenance. Great, and 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 you know, I I, I actually um, had a part in the road to wow that many years ago as a member of the Planning and Zoning Commission, and um, you know, everybody's intentions were good. Um, you know, but and we learn from our mistakes. Uh, in, in terms of elevations, actual elevations, have any elevations been presented to staff? Have we seen elevations? Yeah. Elevations were provided to staff as a concept of their product type. Um, however, elevations aren't required um, with a rezoning or preliminary development plan. Um, so simply materials were provided for in the text. So when are we going to see? Or when will staff or the Planning and Zoning Commission see elevations? We would see elevations at building permitting. They're not required um, in a planned unit development for single-family residential. They would be required for a condominium-type product. So there's not going to be any review of the elevations? Elevations will be reviewed. Um, against the development text at building permitting um, and meet the appearance code as well as the additional standards that are provided in the text. There will be um, no individual review of each elevation. You know, I, I think as you would expect and as we would all expect, I think I would have a pretty high expectation for yep. the elevations here. Um, you know, what I saw at the conceptual level, and I understand it was just the conceptual level, um, I, I, I would say didn't meet my expectations. I, there could have been several iterations since then. That's been a long time ago. I, I believe, Mr. Licklider, I think what we showed is, is what, what the company is building, you know, for the first, for the first time in this market. Okay, um, so it's new to this market because yes. I, I believe what I saw was what was maybe an example of uh, something in Indiana uh, and, and other markets and, you know, that. And while Matt Callahan addresses, I, I'm going to find the standards. Uh, Matt Callahan, Pulte Homes, 4900 Tuttle Crossing. Uh, Boulevard. Um, the elevations will be very consistent with the uh, character and design of other uh, new newer communities. Um, I actually have a set of sample elevations that I'd be happy to pass along around yeah. this evening. If, if it's you only just start one here. package, so I'll it, start. You, you start there. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you. And the, so is it, is it accurate that, that this is new? This is not something that we've we've brought from Florida or Arizona or whatever, but it's a, it's a new design, so unique this, to Dublin? This is a new series of homes for the company. Um, we are offering it over in the, uh, in the Indianapolis market. Uh, we offer it in, in what I would call uh, our uh, communities, uh, if you're familiar with Indianapolis, Carmel, Westfield, uh, you know, communities, suburbs that are very similar to what we have here in Dublin. Um, some of the homes in the, uh, are the pictures, the elevations, and the packet that I'm passing around uh, the ones across the top are actual photos of homes that were built in uh, the Carmel area, and the ones below are some stylized renderings. Um, I would say that the, you know, what we offer here would be very much in in character and, and style of what you what you'll see on the pack as it comes around. Okay, thank you. Um, can you tell us that um, in these past projects, did it end up being a senior-dominated project? Yeah, it does. It really, what happens is these homes are really designed for the seniors or, or really this is kind of the, the, you know, the folks who have lived in their home for, you know, 10, 15, 20 years, the two-story traditional home with four or five bedrooms, and now the kids are out of school. They're ready to downsize a little bit. They're not quite ready for a very specific condominium style of living, but they're ready for something different. So these plans are very much... Designed and uh, designed to cater to those buyers seeking first floor living. I like to make the comparison that um, you know the family buyer, if they're going to buy in this area, they're typically typically going to seek a home that, that's you know more of a conventional two story home with four or five bedrooms. Whereas these, um, as Tom said, you know they come standard with owner suites on the first floor. 
Um, so yeah, we, we do find that, that the buyer segment is what we've uh, tried to design them for. Do you know what percentage of these are gonna be like three car garages or that the corner units or how do you usually plan that out? Uh, three car garage uh, come, become, comes available on all the homes. So it, it'll be up to the buyers. Okay. But based on the, the size of the homes and the design and the size of the lots, there'll be space for a three car garage in, on every lot. Now, Tim and I might disagree on this, but if the edge group, your landscape architects, think that a fence is a defining feature for your subdivision and it looks good, and this is what you should do, because our homeowner subdivision is putting all their fences back in, probably about two or three miles of them, and they are an interesting way to demark a special area. So, I mean, him and I are going <laughs> to respectfully disagree on this, but if if you think that's an important aspect to the project and you think it's an aesthetic element and it's going to allow you to plant on both sides of it or do whatever you got to do, I, you know, I, 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 I'm not against fencing. I think it can be a, if the homeowners keep it up and paint it. So, thank you. I might have missed it, but what, what are the price points in here? We expect the homes will average right around 500,000. We think the range will be from the mid, you know, final selling price will be in the mid 400s to just over 500,000. So we're, we're talking about probably right about 500. Nick, Nikki or Claudia, in, in, in terms of the, the three car garages, for example, I mean, that's, that's subject to regulation, right? I mean, you know, I, I remember regulation from a long time ago, you know, um, there's only a certain percentage, you know, of the front elevation that, that can be garage. I, I forget what the percentage is. Correct. The, so that would apply. The appearance code, yeah, does regulate um, for a front-loaded or side-loaded garage. Great. Thank you. I guess just about first blush, I was kind of surprised that at the four to 500,000 range that those elevations would uh, were finished the way they were finished. But... That's just my observation. What's the process? Is, is this different than a normal process? Because it seems to me we, uh, whether it go through P&Z, that there's always a look at what the product is, the final, maybe not the final, but at least some elevations from an architectural and uh, finishing kind of issues. It, what am I missing here? Oftentimes, our applicants volunteer elevations. Uh, they're not required. Um, most of any required architectural details would be prescribed in the development text as that is the um, regulating zoning once the ordinance is approved. So in the, in the development text, uh, when you start talking about materials, there obviously you're going to have to have some elevations to demonstrate what's there, whether it be stone or brick or, or whatever. So I guess along the way you're going to see something. You, that's an option. We've certainly seen development texts that have character images. Um, but still the words would be the regulating component. This development text in particular um, does place additional regulations on homes fronting Highland Croy Road because um, staff and the applicant were aware of um, an increased visibility and sensitivity to those lots. Um, so some architectural details are required to be added or restricted. Help me, Amy. In the, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to state that in the um, development standards, it talks about the cladding materials and the percentages, which are a little bit higher than what we find in our general appearance code. Um, it also it also addresses your concern about the um, garage frontages and percentages there. But um, Amy can speak to what happened in their planning and zoning commission meeting. But it isn't terribly uh, unusual to have just these development standards in text form versus pictorial form. Um, Don't we usually have a final development plan stage where we see development, um, we see renderings, and then we talk about, you know, building materials and percentages and kind of fine tune what our code is? So for single family platted lots, we really do not. If you remember that the commission um, had a lot of images in the Riviera text for architecture, but as those plats went through and the final development plans went through, the planning commission approved landscaping, street sections, and the final plats, but you did not review or re approved elevations for any of the indiv individual homes. 
the Celtic crossing text, for example, the Wellington Reserve text, they have no images in them whatsoever. It is really all words. The image heavy ones really are the newer ones. They're Tartan West, Tartan Ridge, and um, uh, Riviera. But it is not a requirement in our zoning to have elevations approved for single family padded lots. The percentages comes into place when they're condominiums. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for the applicant? Okay, we'll take these one at a time. First, we just vote straight up on ordinance Wait, 20. Public testimony. Is there anybody oh, is signed there any? in? Nobody had signed in. Is there anybody that would like to comment on any of these three ordinances? Hearing none, uh, ordinance 26-17. Yes. 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 Okay, ordinance 27-17, should I move to amend to add the two conditions as Claudia outlined being the, the waiver of the fees and the replacement as she described? Correct. If you're amenable to the tree preservation replacement request, then you would modify, amend the rezoning to add the two additional conditions. Okay, so then I would make a motion to modify Ordinance 2717 as Jennifer just outlined. Yep. Is there a second on the, on the motion to amend? Yes. 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 And on the ordinance, the amended ordinance itself. Yes. 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 And on ordinance twenty-eight dash seven. Need a motion to approve the preliminary plat. There are two parts to that rezoning, the preliminary development plan and then the preliminary plat. Okay, then I move to approve the preliminary plat. Second. Judy? Yes. 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 And on ordinance 28-17. Yes. 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 Okay, I make a motion to dispense with council rules of order to address ordinances 30-17, 31-17 amended, and 32-17 together. Is there a second? A second. Judy? Can, yeah. Judy, could you please call the vote on the motion? I think, Mike, did you second my motion to dispense with the rules of order? Could we call the motion, the, the vote on the motion to dispense with the rules of order? Mr. Yes. 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 And on the three ordinances, Dan. Yes, good evening. Uh, no significant, no change really to these from um, when uh, Director Muma presented them at your last meeting. I do want to just mention or call your attention to Ordinance 3017 relative to the reference to salt barn construction. Um, you might recall from your uh, capital improvement program that the original plan was to, to uh, reconstruct one salt barn and then another one a couple of years out. Uh, we're we're relooking that relative to our capacity to um, uh, due to some other savings and other projects to perhaps move that up. Uh, not committed to that yet, but this the way that we're uh, 
presenting this would give us the ability to do that if that presents itself. But right now we're studying the efficiencies of going ahead and uh, replacing both salt barns at the same time. So we'll keep you abreast of that. But this would give us the higher number, if you will. I'll put it in my simple terms to be able to do that, but not quite sure we're going to do that yet. And also our Deputy Director uh, of Finance, David Gaines, is here as well. Help me tag team any questions you may have. Thank you. Questions from Council? Chris? Yeah, any, any of them. 3017. Yeah. Um, I just, I hope that uh, we can, I realize that Angel wasn't able to be with us this evening. Um, I, I do hope that we continue the conversation that we had started uh, last time um, with respect to debt, generally speaking. Um, and I wanted to make certain that um, it was clear that for the um, 3217, um, those funds have largely already been committed, contractually committed to, correct? That's correct, yes. So really, uh, you know, what we're looking at tonight is making sure that we pay the bills that we've already entered into an agreement for. Yes. Thank you. I did not have anybody sign in. Is there anybody here that would like to uh, testify on any of these three ordinances? Hearing none, Judy. We'll vote the vote on all three. We're just voting on the three ordinances. All together? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ms. Uh, yes. Ms. Saley? Yes. Mr. Lecklider? Yes. Mayor Peterson? Yes. Vice Mayor Reiner? Yes. Ms. Sam Rose Groom? Yes. And Mr. Keenan? Yes. First reading ordinances, ordinance 36 17, Judy? Authorizing the provision of certain incentives to Brian K. Dorner, MD, Incorporated, to induce it to purchase a new facility, to retain and expand an office and its associated operations and workforce all within the city, and authorizing the execution of an economic development agreement. I'll reduce it. Thanks, Tim. How you doing, Kyle? Good. How about yourself? Fine. Thank you. Good evening, members of City Council. Before you tonight, uh, staff is propo proposing an economic development agreement. Uh, for the uh, uh, to Brian K. Dorner, MD, Inc., also known as uh, Dorner Plastic Surgery, for the relocation expansion of their corporate headquarters within Dublin. Dorner Plastic Surgery, formerly known as Capital City Cosmetic Surgery and Skin Health Center, is a locally uh, cosmetic plastic surgery practice which provides surgical and non-surgical procedures and has a fully accredited OR for surgery. Dr. Derner is board certified by the, by the American Board of Plastic Surgery and was voted Best Plastic Surgeon in Columbus by Reader's Choice Awards. They were founded in Dublin in 2004 and due to their success, uh, need new space to accommodate their growing business. This project will result in the retention of 13 existing employees in Dublin and the addition of 23 new employees by the end of uh, 2021. The EDA is a four-year, 12% performance incentive on withholdings, uh, capped at 21,800. The city expects to net approximately 147,940 over the four-year term. Uh, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have about the agreement at this time. Questions from council? Any discussion? All right, we will see you uh, back on June 12th, Kyle. Thank you very much. Thank you. Resolution 42-17, Judy. A resolution authorizing the city manager to enter into an agreement with Washington Township to provide communication services for the Washington Township okay. Fire Department. I'll reduce it. Good evening, members of council. Uh, this resolution would authorize the city manager to renew the agreement with our longtime partner, the Washington Township Fire Department, for dispatching and communication services. This agreement's slightly different than our last uh, our last one in that it's going to be a three and a half year uh, agreement. It would uh, reflect a 5% increase each year. Uh, this agreement will take us to the end of the current fire services levy that the township has. The ending will coincide uh, with that date. And we have included in this agreement uh, a tentative agreement with the uh, township to uh, adjust them to the current uh, billing formula we have with our other partners in NREC. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Chief. Questions from Council? 
Chief, anything you want to add? We good? Okay. Judy? Mayor Peterson? Yes. Ms. Sam Rose Groom? Yes. Ms. Saley? Mr. She's Keenan? had to step out. Mr. Keenan? Yes. Vice Mayor Reiner? Yes. Mr. Lackleiter? Yes. Ms. Saluto? Yes. Resolution 43-17, Judy? Accepting the lowest and best bid for the 100 gigabit doublink ignite fiber optic project. I'll reduce it. Don't see Doug. Dan? I've got it. Yes, okay. Doug's uh, away at training. Uh, so uh, per the staff report, this has to do with the phase two build of the uh, doublink fiber optic system uh, to connect various school facilities. This is uh, in response to our real estate and transfer of property agreement between the city and Dublin schools, also relative to the future uh, parking garage site, library site, as you may recall, that agreement. Uh, the one thing I do want to let council know is that while um, there is a list of um, uh, school facilities that are to be connected on here. Specifically, this calls out Bailey Elementary School. That was not required as part of our agreement with the schools, but we went ahead and bid it as an alternate. We may non-perform that. Uh, we wanted to know what that was. So that, this number does reflect that build, but right now we're probably going to non-perform that. It's not required as part of that, that development agreement. Um, and I just want to make you aware of that. So other than that, uh, staff recommends um, approval of this resolution. Would we non-perform it because it was cost prohibitive? Did those numbers come back greater than what we expected? Or were we just hoping maybe it would come in lower? No, there were three schools that we said we would not connect as part of this. One was Bailey. Uh, the other one was... I think um, one was Wright. Wright. And the other and one was what is the other one out by the airport? That's right, is by the yeah, airport. right, and there was one other one. And, I, uh, I think the one on Sawmill Road up there. Um, yeah, I can't. I apologize. There were three schools specifically. The reason we included Bailey is because it it actually is more in the center of it's the Dublin the system, yeah. but it's far off too. We have to go up Dublin Road as a lateral. It is a very difficult build. There's a lot of rock, uh, we'll, but we'll work with the schools relative to you know maybe they could pick up that option or find other ways to get to it ultimately. So. We're not forgetting about those schools, and it's not that those schools will in any way be underserved. Uh, they'll just be able to buy more um, internet service, you know, to, to bolster. And and you know, I'm sure the schools will want to keep those at the same level as the other schools. But we, they can off ramp these other schools onto the doubling system and save significant dollars there. So, yeah, I commend you. you and Dr. Hoadley, Dana, on working this out. It's a great example of us all working together. Yes, for the thank greater you. For that. Good. We I appreciate their cooperation a lot. Judy? Mr. Lackleiter? Yes. Ms. Saluto? Yes. Mayor Peterson? Yes. Ms. Saley? Vice Mayor Reiner? Yes. Mr. Keenan? Yes. Ms. Sam Rose Group? Yes. Resolution 44-17, Judy? Waiving competitive bidding requirements pursuant to Section 8.04. I'll reduce it. Thank you, Tim. Allison? Hi. Good evening. This is the annual uh, time that I have to come to you. Um, our sponsors are, again, Guinness and Coors Light. And as such, by state law, only Superior Beverage is allowed to sell that to us in this area. So we need to waive competitive bidding in order to buy those products for the Irish Festival. And I can answer any questions. Questions from council? I have a question. I know last year we discussed um, the competitive bid process. And my recollection, I don't know that it's correct, but my recollection was that it would be bid every so often um, to make sure that we could check that we were market competitive. We don't actually go out to bid on this because they're the only people that we can buy those products from. Um, we do often hear from other beverage groups whether they want to sponsor or not. Um, Coors Light has been our sponsor for over 20 years. Guinness came in a couple years ago. Um, so if another beverage product did come in and wanted to sponsor at a higher level, we would certainly listen to that proposal. Didn't it re revolve around Guinness in particular and Killian's to get those particular brands at the festival? Yeah, and Killian's is actually in with Coors Light, um, which is a little confusing now. That so many of them have consolidated over the years that sometimes it's hard to keep track of who's still with who. Um, but So that's when we stopped, when we got Guinness a few years ago is when we stopped selling our own Irish Festival Stout. I think that was three years ago. Any other questions? You know, over the past years in, in uh, quizzing them on this, it's really interesting because we actually had uh, Anheuser-Busch interested at one time, and, but 
their, the contracts you guys have let have been very sound for the taxpayers and for the good of this deal. So I've been, wa I've been quizzing you over the years just out of curiosity to see who's in the game. And I thought you guys are doing a really good job. And they are, um, up until this year, they have been our largest sponsor. We will tomorrow be on, um, announcing a larger sponsor uh, for this year only. Great. Any other questions? Okay, Judy. Mr. Keenan. Yes. Ms. Sam Rose Grooms. Yes. Vice Mayor Reiner. Yes. Mr. Lucklider. Yes. Ms. Saludo. Yes. Mayor Peterson. Yes. Other portion of our agenda remaining with Allison, the request to serve alcohol for Dublin Arts Council Bread Festival. And David Guion is here as well. Um, if you have any questions about the Bread Festival, but the Bread Festival will be returning this year. Um, we've been working with them. In fact, we had our first um, logistics meeting with them last week. They are going to be moving to October 21st this year, which is a bye week for Ohio State football. Wow. And um, they are planning on having the same layout. And um, so we've been working with them to basically do the same plans we did last year with their alcohol service. Questions? Staff or David, anything you want to add? Choose I feel like you've sat here all night. We at least have to tell you how nice it was last year, and we're looking forward to it this year. Good job, David. Let's Good call on the bye week. <laughs> yes, very smart. All right, I make a motion that we approve the request. Second. Judy? Mr. Lucklider? Yes. Vice Mayor Reiner? Yes. Mr. Keenan? Yes. Ms. Sam Rose Grooms? Yes. Ms. Saludo? Yes. Mayor Peterson? Yes. I'll call the Kaufman Park Dublin Irish Festival. Allison? Well, as all of you know, this is our 30th anniversary, and we're looking forward to a great celebration, and we'll hope you'll approve this request. Questions from council? I make a motion that we approve the request. Second. Judy? Mayor Peterson? Yes. Ms. Saludo? Yes. Ms. Sam Rose Groom? Yes. Mr. Keenan? Yes. Vice Mayor Reiner? Yes. Mr. Lechleiter? Yes. Acceptance of the Tax Incentive Review Council and Housing Council meeting minutes. David? <laughs> On, that one? on May 2nd, the city conducted its annual tax incentive review council meeting along with the housing council meeting for the Bridge Park community reimbursement area. Council members Keenan and Reiner both serve, serve on the, uh, with both these entities. However, both were absent from the meeting and we were happy to have council member Lechleiter there. <laughs> I had an excused absence and asked uh, <laughs> Councilman Lechleiter to represent me. Thank you. Yes. Representatives from the local school districts, vocational schools, Franklin County Auditor's Office, and Franklin County Commissioner's appointees were present. During the meeting, staff reported on the status of TIP districts, highlighting those that increased or decreased substantially. Within the active TIFs, the city has made over $176 million of public improvements, which has generated over $636 million in private investment. With respect to Bridge Park CRA, since no financial activity occurred in 2016, there was nothing to report. The county auditor requests that the city council by motion approve the minutes from the meeting, and we are requesting that this evening. Any questions from council? I make a motion that we accept the minutes and reports of the TIRC and the housing council. Second. Ooh. Judy? Ms. Saludo? Yes. Mr. Keenan? Yes. Mayor Peterson? Yes. Vice Mayor Reiner? Yes. Mr. Lechleiter? Yes. Ms. Samaros Group? Yes. Staff comments. Thanks, David. Thanks. Uh, staff comments. Dan? Yes. Uh, just a few things I wanted to highlight that was in your uh, for information only packet. Uh, first of all, the first uh, library advisory committee uh, did, did meet. I want to thank the mayor for kicking that off. Uh, in your packet is a list of the upcoming meetings that they said. These are public meetings, by the way, will be advertised as such. Those will be conducted at the Dublin Library. So anyone who wants to attend those are welcome. Uh, the Council of Governments memo and the Smart Corridor update uh, gave you a relatively extensive update on that. I will do that on a quarterly basis as that involves the Council of Governments and providing you the minutes of those meetings and so forth. I want to thank uh, uh, Donna for her yeoman's work in putting that report and update together. Uh, appreciate that very much. Uh, a memo on the AEP Sumac Dublin 138 KV line, that's probably new information to you. Uh, staff has been working with AEP on this possibility for quite quite a while now. Continue to work with them on options and updates. Um, uh, Director Megan O'Callaghan will give you an update, uh, we hope, in more detail on June 12th. Um, 
I, I wanted to thank, and I should have chimed in earlier, but for those who are left, the Citizen University, I want to thank those participants, but I want to also say that uh, it's very, it's equally rewarding for staff to have the opportunity to tell our story, uh, what, I, what we call the behind the curtains look and how the city operates and, and our staff does take great pride in what they do, but as much telling the story about how they do it. So we appreciate their involvement with that. And I, I also, and I appreciate Council Member Lechleiter mentioning the 21 Best Fleet Award that we got uh, to Daryl and the fleet technicians that we have. Um, they do just a great job. Also, uh, Police Officer Chuck Collier being recognized as the State of Ohio uh, Best uh, School Resource Officer in the state. Congratulations to him. And then last, the uh, Community Relations Team has won a number of awards, which we greatly appreciate. I know that there was a letter to the editor and some, some concern about the recent Household Hazardous Waste event. That's in the collection and the and the backups and so forth. I, it, I went myself to go to that and, and found out that the wait from the point that I entered the line later in the afternoon was like an hour plus away. And it reminded me of the first couple times that we did this because uh, and the setup and the and the overwhelming response that we had. That's that's good news and I think it's good that people are getting this out of their households. We encourage them to continue to do that. On the back side of that, I think what had happened is we had, it was Earth Day, we had a lot more uh, people come than normal uh, unexpectedly, and the logistics had adjusted to what we were used to getting, and then we had an influx. I think the letter reflects of more latex paints and things like that, so logistically it was challenging. But I want to thank Swaco and uh, Ashland, who has been our sponsor uh, and allowed us to use their facility ever since the first one that we did, and Dublin has stayed true to that partnership in holding this event. And I thank the staff for all the effort that it takes to provide the logistics and, and support the effort when they when they provide that. So it's a good partnership. And of course, we regret any backups, but we encourage our residents to not be frustrated, but to get that stuff to other drop-offs. Thank you. So it sounds like they're working on that too in the letter that they're looking for ideas for next year to, to make improvements. So that's yes, all good. That's correct. Great. Thank you, Dana. Uh, Council Committee reports. P and Z and Amy had to step out. Administrative Committee. Mike. Just uh, quickly, uh, we didn't have time this evening to get into um, the review process that we have discussed. You have uh, an email with information. We'll, we'll try and get to it at the next meeting. Thanks, Mike. Community Development. John. Uh, nothing. Finance Committee. Mike. Nothing. Public Service Committee. Amy's not here. Dublin Friendship Association. Christina. Thank you. Uh, with Sarah Ott's departure to her new job, we were short a chair. So uh, I asked Jenny if she would like to be chair. She said she would like to remain as vice chair. So I volunteered to be chair. Um, so that has changed. I also reached out to the Washington Township trustees to ask them if they would like to appoint um, another representative. And so they are going to discuss that at their next meeting and let us know. Um, Nancy is uh, working with a group of OSU students to take a look at the recommendations that, I, that we had distributed to council several weeks ago um, and take a look at uh, what countries there are potential trade opportunities um, with, with regards to the recommendations. Um, so I'll work with her on uh, getting a summary for that together as soon as we can. Thank you very much. Uh, Morpsy, Tim. Uh, we had a meeting a week ago this past Thursday, um, and uh, a lot of conversation um, everywhere, really, about this 33 Smart Corridor. Eric Phillips, um, who I, has probably appeared before us before, the Union County Marysville Economic Development Executive Director, uh, gave a presentation regarding the 33 Smart Corridor. And then, um, uh, I guess for me, that was the highlight. Um, and Dana Chinaman, if... Uh, you had a, uh, a different recollection. One thing to mention, I don't know if I've mentioned this before, whether you've read anything about this, um, but um, there was a proposed resolution that was part of the consent agenda regarding uh, Morpsey's support of the Midwest Connect um, Hyperloop freight and passenger corridor proposal uh, for the Hyperloop One Global Challenge. Dana, help me with the details here. Um, if it, it, It's very conceptual as I understand it, but it, the, the long and the short of it is um, this is uh, the exploration of a technology that basically will put you in a tube and shoot you to Chicago in 20 minutes. I, it's no joke. Wow. I mean, you know, this is for real. It's Beat something me that they're pursuing. 
you know, both for passengers and, and, and for freight, it would connect uh, Pittsburgh to Columbus, Columbus to Chicago. Yes, I mean, I, I can't speak to the technology any, any better. I, th I think you did a good job of highlighting that. But, but it is an express type of uh, opportunity, pretty futuristic and trying to align things according to that, so. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of hard to get your head around, you know, I don't know how many Gs you might pull or, you know, whatever, <laughs> you know. Anyway, that, that's it, thank you. Maybe those plastic surgeon folks could help out. Yeah, really, <laughs> keep them on standby. Uh, Logan Union Champaign Regional Planning Commission. Nothing. Yeah. Nothing? How about US 33 Innovation Corridor? We had a meeting a week ago this past Friday. Uh, that would have been May 12th. Um, again, most of the discussion centered around um, uh, the smart mobility project and uh, fiber and a redundant loop, which is going to run down Industrial Parkway um, and so forth. Dana, anything? Nothing to add. No. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Dublin Arts Council, John. Nothing, thank you. Board of Education, Chris, Christina. You know, I misspoke last time and said we did not have another meeting. We do, in fact, have another meeting, and it's June 7th. So uh, after our June 7th meeting with them, we'll have something to report. We'll look forward to that report. Chief, anything you want to add? All righty. Uh, Council Roundtable, Chris. You always call me first. Well, um, it's just my left to right. Uh, uh, several of us attended the Leadership Dublin graduation on May 10th, and that was really impressive. They, uh, Dan, no, Dana and Christina were there, and they presented their um, projects, and they were impressive and well thought out, and those folks spent a lot of time on that and effort, so uh, it was a great time. Uh, attended the Crawford Hoying open house on the 11th, and they did a really fantastic job of building out their interior space, and um, Brent Crawford had indicated that it was a great sales tool for them, and... Uh, it, they did a great job on the interior of that building. Um, thank you, Chief, for having us to the memorial on the 12th. It was exceptionally well done, and um, we even followed up with a thank you letter, so your mom taught you really well. Uh, but that was a great time to um, remember all of our fallen officers. Um, attended the business after hours at the Country Club at Muirfield on the 16th, and um, it was a beautiful night, and they had a fantastic turnout. I saw some of our economic development folks there. Um, and then I know Christine and I attended the, um, the concert Saturday night for Nationwide Children's Fundraiser. Uh, it was a, a beautiful night. They raised a lot of money, um, and certainly the city was well represented. So um, thank you for the opportunity to do that. That's all I have. Thank you. Christina? Thanks. Um, likewise, thank you, Chief, for a really lovely memorial. It was very nice to also meet the um, Hilliard Chief of Police and um, Hilliard's mayor as well. So I really appreciate that they came. Um, happy belated Mother's Day to all you mothers out there. Um, and I have a question. Um, we had um, Metro Parks in here talking about how they want to do some stuff in our parks. Can we get an update on that at some point in the next few weeks? Sure. Thank you. Is that it? Yeah. Michael? Tim? Nothing. John? Nothing. Thank you. We're adjourned.